Greetings and welcome. My name is Aaron Craig with Be Honest Games, and this is part two of how to build a cutscene. So I'm going to pick up exactly where we left off, and let's just jump right into it. So we are going to be creating a dialogue box in the first couple of steps. So what we're going to do is make that object first and set it up so that when we make it, it is ready to display text already. So we're going to create a new object, call this OBJ dialog box and we're going to give it the sprite inside of miscellaneous because we already have it it's already set up ready to go and we're going to do a create event and the create event is going to be fairly simple we're just going to give it a variable called my text and it's going to start as undefined undefined is kind of like null it is a value that game maker recognizes but it is kind of a invalid value so when we do this, if we forget to set my text, it will say that it is an error and you'll know exactly where the problem is because it is undefined and if you have a variable like that, then you can debug it pretty easily. We're gonna add one more event and it's gonna be the draw event, just a regular draw. And inside of here, we're just going to draw the text that we want it to. Now first, we have to draw self, because anytime you take over the drawing event, you have to do that, otherwise the sprite won't show up. And then we're gonna just draw text ext, which stands for extended, which gives us more options. So we're gonna do bb box left, which is the bounding box left of the current sprite that we're in. We're gonna say plus four, and then to bring that in a little bit, bb box top plus four, and we're going to say my text. I'm going to bring this bigger so we can see everything I'm typing. My text, which we already set up. We're going to say separation, which is this argument here of 16, so that we know how, how much space to give the text inside of the dialog box. And then we're going to say the last one, which is the width. So we don't want the text to go farther than the width of the sprite but we also want to give it a little bit of padding, which we're going to say is 16. So now when we make this sprite or this, this object, all we have to do is create it and set my text. And when it is on the screen, it will draw the text inside of the text box. Now, if you're going to be using more text than one text box can show, I would recommend looking at my dialogue talking system and you can implement cutscenes using that creating dialogue boxes that would have multiple sets that you that the character would have to go through this is simply for one dialogue box with just a little bit of text if you want to do more you can you just have to get a little more in depth which i didn't want to hear because i've already covered that in a different series so with that out of the way let's go over to the cutscene and let's jump into actually creating this now, inside of the room, uh, I know the exact coordinates that we need, but if you are making a cutscene, you are not going to know. So it could be very difficult to find out exactly where to tell your character to move, because we need to actually come in and say, OBJ Sarah, which is this character here, move her X coordinate this much, and then move her Y coordinate this much, and then move her X coordinate... It can get very complicated and it can be very difficult to do, especially if you've got collisions inside of here. So in here we have this sprite collision and we're going to make an object because uh, I want this to be semi-realistic. So this object collision is going to have this sprite and we're going to mark it as solid. And then inside of Baldrick, we're going to add a collision event with that. And inside of Sarah, we're gonna add a collision event with that as well. And what that means is that we have to be very careful of where we move the character during a cutscene. Because if I bring in this, and I say move a certain, certain amount, and I were to put her directly over or into one of these uh, collision boxes, then she would attempt to move, but she would no longer be able to move. So I'm going to put some of them around 
so that when we are building this, if we mess up, we're gonna know exactly how we messed up and where we messed up at. So it can be very useful. This is the way I normally do collisions because it allows you to do collisions without having to have every single object have its own collision and it just, in my opinion, makes things a lot simpler. But you have to be very careful because if you run into one of these collisions during the cutscene, you'll have issues. But let's go ahead and give it a try and see what we can accomplish. So I'm gonna put this one right here. And then inside of our workspace, um, we're gonna go back to the cutscene treasure chest and we are going to make the first step. So the first step that we wanna do is actually just have Sarah walk out of her bed. So I'm going to call this walk out of bed. And by giving it comments, it tells us what the case does and allows us to easily see which each case should be doing. Now, when we make cases, I would recommend doing very little inside of each case. Have it be simple, straightforward, and easy to debug or change later on if you need to. If you try to do too much inside of a case, uh, it becomes unwieldy and can become difficult to actually get working properly. So make the steps small, that the, the case zero, case one, make them small and precise so that you know exactly what they do. And we are gonna be affecting everything through this one cutscene object. Now, a different approach would be to actually have different objects depending on the cutscene, do different things. And that is a very valid approach. Like we could come over here and we could say, if, if the cutscene is equal to treasure chest and it's active, then do this. I don't want to, because I want to put every single thing inside of this cutscene treasure chest. If anything were to go wrong, we know where to look and we don't have code spread out. It makes it very simple to debug and figure out later on. So case zero, Sarah walks out of bed. First thing we want to do is change her sprite index to SPR Sarah walk right. Now, I know that these, these assets that I'm using and what they're named, so if you don't know, look at them, get a, get a feel for them, or just copy along with whatever I'm doing. We have to manually control every single thing that's going to happen. So if Sarah is going to walk to the right, you want her to look like she's walking to the right, which is important. Now inside of here, we're gonna say if obj sarah.x doesn't equal, and if we go over to the room, we can have her walk right over here, and this area is like 718, and you can see the x and y coordinates are down here. So the x coordinate that I want is 718. So if her x does not equal 718, we're gonna say plus plus, obj sarah.x and this plus plus is just a way of incrementing her x coordinate by one each step of the game different step than this uh, that works pretty well but we also need to adjust her image speed equal to one that way as she's moving she's also being animated so if you have any issues throughout coding this uh, if your character doesn't look right or doesn't move where they're supposed to, you have to come in here and take a look at this. Sometimes it can be difficult to remember all of the things you need to set, such as their sprite index, their image speed, and you also have to know rooms well enough to know which direction to actually move them. We know Sarah is going to be right here, and her x-coordinate is 656 starting out. We want to move her to 718, which is an increment, which means going up. But if she were to be going to the left, we would need to do a minus minus instead. So inside of this if statement, if she's not there, then she's going to move. Then we're going to say else, and this else will only activate once uh, her dot x is equal to 718. We're going to say obj sarah dot image speed equals zero, obj sarah dot image index is equal to zero. So we're gonna have her stop moving and stop animating, and we're gonna say plus plus current step. Now, the last important thing that I mention here is this break right here. 
Switch statements are really great, especially for accepting different inputs and looking at different methods if you want multiple things to activate at once. So if we were accepting input from a keyboard or something, I could say case uh, VK right on the keyboard or D or case, you know, so case uh, zero would be right on the keyboard and then you'd have case D. And if you didn't put a break statement, it would check both of those and then you could put a line of code to say do move the character to the right if they press either of those things. This break right here says case zero only look right here. Do not look outside of this bounds for more code. If you forget to break, which you might throughout this code because we're going to be putting a lot of them in there, your character is going to do a couple strange things and that depends on where you forget it because they're going to be looking at both cases or maybe more than just two and trying to activate them all at once. So don't forget the break. Case one is going to be uh, creating a dialog box. So we're going to create a dialog box here and I'm going to say db equals instance create layer and all we need to do is create it right above where Sarah is. If you have a specific spot you want your dialog box to go, this would be the place to put it. I am going to be just putting it above the character who is speaking. So I'm going to say um, obj Sarah dot x and obj Sarah dot y. I'm going to say minus 75 because that will put it above her head, which is what we want it to appear at. And it needs to be in the layer of objects. And we're going to create obj dialog box. Now, this seems right. We're creating a dialog box. That's perfect. The problem is that it is not going to work properly because later on when we try and destroy this dialog box, there's actually going to be an incredible amount of dialog boxes that have been created because this case right here is going to run over and over and over as long as the step is on step one. That means we need to put in a fail safe, like a, a check to see if we should make this box in the first place. And this is kind of confusing and it, and it may not seem necessary, but trust me, I spent a lot of time figuring out why I could not destroy dialog boxes because it turned out I had created hundreds of them over the course of just a few seconds. So we're gonna say if instance doesn't exist through the use of this exclamation point, obj dialog box. So if there is no dialog box, then create that dialog box. And that will just create one dialog box, which is exactly what we need it to do. And then down here, we're gonna say db.myText, because we can access that variable directly, equals what are you doing in my house? With an exclamation point at the end. So now we have a dialog box created we also want to do obj baldrick dot sprite index. We're going to set this equal to spr baldrick surprise, which I spelled wrong. So we're going to change his sprite index as well so that it looks like, you know, he puts his hands up in the air and he looks all surprised. Now, there's two ways to proceed about doing dialog boxes. The first one is like this. If counter is equal to 120, which would be two full seconds in the game, then we would reset the counter to zero and we would move on to the next step. And the way to do that, you also have to have an else statement here that says plus plus counter, otherwise it's never going to actually move. And then we would have a break statement at the end. This will go on for two seconds and obviously you can set it to whatever value you desire. But if you wanted to have the player have input over when it would go, then you would want to do something like this. I'm going to go ahead and comment that whole section out. Just say if keyboard check pressed VK space or whatever one it is that you are checking for, you just say plus plus current step. 
And then we would move on to case two, voila la. That's two different ways to handle it. What I'm gonna do for now is I am going to keep the waiting because we're gonna have it turn so that they, the player can control later segments. But this one, I want to feel like they're kind of watching you know, a movie, like a cutscene. They don't have any control over what's happening and it's gonna proceed at its own pace. It gives you, the director of the game, uh, full power over how it should look and feel. So, let's run this and see if everything is working properly, because that covers a lot in this part. So right here, we can see these invisible walls, not so invisible. I'm gonna come over here. We're gonna say, no longer visible. I'm not gonna bother reloading though. So I'm gonna press space, music's going, but this is not set correctly. So we need to come back in here and figure out exactly what we forgot, because this is gonna happen a lot. Uh, there's just gonna be a lot of debugging, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it with you. Even though I've done this, I still make mistakes even following what's already working. So, let's open this up down here, and let's follow this. So, OBJ Baldrick is not set before reading it. So inside of this OBJ uh, cutscene, and it is at step zero, line 20, at cutscene treasure chest. So, not much of an error. You probably saw it before I did. I don't know how to spell sometimes. That, that happens. Okay, so now the invisible things are gone. That's perfect. Okay. That's great. So, this is working properly. We have it created. Now, we can't do anything because that's all there is to it right now. But that's a great first step, or I guess the great first two steps. So that is the beginning of our cutscene. We have Sarah moving, we have her creating an object, and we have a dialogue box appearing, which is fantastic. So that's all I'm going to cover right now. That is a lot to soak in. But if you understand this, then you are off to a great start, because this is going to be most of the rest of the series. I'm going to show you exactly how to do the rest of it, but if you understand how to manipulate objects and their variables and which uh, things to change as the cutscene's going on, then you basically have it. There's a few tricks that you might still pick up if you follow, but we're just going to be doing a lot of this coding. We're going to be telling Sarah and Baldrick exactly where to go and what to do. If you want to learn how to do the quick time events, I'll throw a card up and you can jump to that video specifically if you want to look at that and figure out how it's done. If not, then I hope you will join me for the next part as we craft even more of this cutscene. But that's all I've got for you guys, so thank you very much for joining me, and as always, have fun making great games and I will talk to you later. If you'd like to support me in making these game dev tutorials, consider sponsoring me on Patreon. The awesome people currently supporting me are on the screen, and they get cool benefits like one-on-one -on -one training sessions, early access to videos, and more. Check it out in the link below, or visit patreon.com slash beyondusgames.